This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, hello, hello. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. And we have, I think, I don't know how to describe this, but it's, you know, I just had Marin Katusa on. That was very spiritual for me that a capitalist can have spiritual feelings for making money and putting deals together, especially green new deals. But this one here is a uh, spiritual because they're educational company and they're so lined up with Rich Dad, it's like we could just merge. And it's um, Dennis Prager of Prager University is one of my heroes. He and I are the same vintage and uh, what he's doing takes a lot of courage. And, um, you know, the going against social media and all this stuff, they keep standing up to it. But nonetheless, what Prager University is putting out is crystal clear, it's great product, great educational, and uh, we're joined at the hip again, Rich Dad and Prager University. And they're getting hammered and we get hammered because we refuse to be censored. And so today we have the CEO of Prager University Foundation. Her name is Marisha Streit. And uh, I think she's still in high school personally, but anyway, <laughs> it's an honor to talk to you. And, you know, please give my regards to Dennis Prager. I mean, you guys are doing a great job. Well, thank you so much. And more than anything, thanks for that compliment. I'll take it given that most of my employees are almost 20 years younger than me. So <laughs> I'll, I'll take the compliment. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's here. Anyway, tell us what's going on with Prager University. It's a little brief history of it. And why are you guys such troublemakers? <laughs> yeah, well, we're troublemakers because you know we believe in self-reliance and and truth, and so that is really contradictory to what you're hearing in media and in schools right. these days. Uh, you know, critical thinking is out the door. I'll tell my background is I'm a I'm a former educator. I used to be a headmistress of a school. I have a uh, a master's in education. Uh, I've been working for PragerU for ten years. So the the brief history was that Dennis Prager. Um, who has this amazing ability to explain things in a, in a quick, concise, in such clear way. Uh, he and his partner, Alan Estrin, came to me about 10 years ago and said, we have penicillin for the mind. We need to figure out how do we use the internet to get these, this information out there. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna give it a shot. And they hired me at that point. They called me a general uh, without an army. Uh, I was uh, about 10 years uh uh, after serving in the, in the Israeli military. And so it was a funny analogy that they used. And when they hired me, we were tasked with using the internet to get important ideas out there. Again, character development, self-reliance, um, and, and basically the basic truth, capitalism versus socialism, American history, we're becoming an, a nation with amnesia. Most people don't even know uh, what our country has gone through. And so we started developing this enterprise called PragerU, um, which is the opposite of most universities. We basically teach the, in many ways, uh, uh, what is not being taught in most schools. We're free of charge. Uh, once upon a time, we were free of censorship, but no, no longer. Uh, 10 years into it, we just eclipsed 5 billion views. The majority of our audience is under the age of 34. We take these complex ideas, we simplify them, we make five minute videos, we make these different little shows, uh, and we just get that information out there. And young people love it because they're realizing that they're, that they're being lied to and they're realizing that the tools that they were supposed to be given in schools are not given to them. And so they're starving for this information. Uh, and that's what we do. Well, let me ask this quick question. Are you guys a physical university or online? No, we're completely online. So our entire existence is virtual, um, which what, what's fun about that is that we don't believe in only pediatric learning. You don't need to learn things only when you're a child. You can learn your entire life and you never have to stop. And so we produce now content from kindergarten. We make little kids shows. Uh, everything about American history, patriotism, capitalism versus socialism, biographies, and our content goes all the way from nine to 99. Uh, and so we have uh, uh, a, virtu a virtual educational existence. And now it's, uh, as, a, as a customer of yours, your material is brilliant. Your five minute videos are crystal clear. They're factual. They're not opinionated. 
And I think that's why you guys are getting into trouble. So would you mind quickly, if you want to, what are some of the challenges that you've had from uh, Silicon socialism? <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, we're experiencing serious big tech censorship. We actually started no noticing the big tech censorship in 2016 um, when on YouTube we would um, release videos and folks in their dorms were not able to see PragerU videos and they would write in and say, what happened? I saw a video last night at my parents' house or when I was out and suddenly I went into call uh, into school and I'm looking for the video is not up online. That was the first time we realized that there was big tech censorship really before most people even spoke about it. And what we realized at that point in time that what YouTube was doing when we uploaded the video, they would put the videos on restricted mode. My first reaction was that must be a mistake because restriction restricted mode was essentially videos that were pornographic or hate speech uh, or incite violence, which were none of those. I mean, you know, Dennis might be a little, you know, extra attractive to some, but certainly not pornographic. Uh, and so we actually laughed about it in the beginning because we just thought it was one giant mistake. Um, and then as we communicated with YouTube and kept asking what's going on, why are you censoring our videos? They would respond to us saying, no, this is not an algorithm. We're actually watching the videos and we are deeming them inappropriate for young people and therefore they're restricted. That was how it all started. And people said, we're exaggerating. It's not such a big deal. And, and of course the goalpost kept moving and moving and moving the censorship um, to uh, the reign of what I call these oligarchs and big tech has become so much more heavy handed that now if they simply don't, it's kind of like those parents that get to say, because I said so, they just get to take down whatever content they don't like and don't agree with. And as we've been diving more into why are certain mm -hmm. videos censored, we've discovered that much of the people that are censoring our videos are folks that are straight out of college. You know, they're 22 years old. They just went through all these diversity training or, or left-wing activist training. I mean, so many of our America's colleges are basically left-wing indoctrination centers. They come out of there, they get these very uh, influential positions in media, and then they get to basically censor whatever ideas they don't like, whatever hurts their feelings because they don't agree with it. And that, that's what's happening in America. And the reason I'm surprised is because when I watch your videos, there's really nothing except the facts in there. Do you, do you know what I mean? It's an, I just don't understand how in the world we can be censored. So I, I give you guys a lot of credit. Um, well, last question is how are you fighting back? Well, first of all, we filed a lawsuit against YouTube, um, but the lawsuit has been effectively stuck in courts whether it was because of the lockdown and COVID or because it's such a, um, a toxic conversation for people in, uh, in the field, everybody's afraid of Google for obvious reasons. Uh, and so we're still waiting on that. But I think there's a bigger fight to fight other than the court of law, and that is the court of public op opinion. People need to be aware of the censorship. We're experiencing in America soft totalitarianism. People don't realize that our freedoms are being taken away from us. Um, we are almost willingly giving away all of our freedom, uh, all of our freedoms because of the convenience of, of technology. Um, and so we are very, very focused on informing people about what is going on. And I would say for anybody who's liberal listening to this, you may not agree with what we have to say, but the old American value is I may not agree with what you have to say, but I'll defend your right to say so, because eventually it will be what you want to say and you will lose your voice as well. And America has been built on free speech. And if we lose free speech, we will lose America as we know we've it. Lost it. I hate to say it, we've lost it. And that's why I give you guys credit. And I, 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 as a client, as a customer, as a consumer of PragerU University stuff, it's not that bad. I mean, I, don't, I think it's wonderful stuff. And I was really surprised to hear how much trouble you have. Now I've had my own problems because, but I do say things I really shouldn't say, but I do say them, but you guys are just educational. And that's what was really surprising to me. Quick question, what's happening with TikTok? Uh, well, TikTok, we are back on TikTok now, but we were uh, what we call in uh, big tech jail for a few days. They put us in and out of jail every once in a while. And what we have. What did you guys do? What could you do against TikTok? 
honestly, we don't even know. And they know they know that they never even tell us what we've done. The recent uh, episode that we've had with censorship was that JW Player, which is um, the company that hosts our website and our app, kick us, kicked us off. And again, they basically say, you know, we just don't like your content. You you violate our community guidelines. That's basically what we hear from everybody. So. Just, and it's I mean, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Well, it's beyond my meager little brain, you know, because I'm going, your stuff is great stuff. I mean, yeah. it's educational. It's educational. And I'll tell you, we are very careful. Not only are we careful, it's not in our nature to attack anyone or hurt anyone. Uh, we just want to give the facts out. And so people can listen and make their own opinion. Uh, it's just the problem is the other side doesn't want the other side to be heard. They don't want conservative, pro-American ideas to even be out there. And that's what they've done in the in the world of education. Yeah. Remember, I came from, from that world. I was an educator. They don't want educators to teach both sides. They want educators to teach one side, a left-wing side. And so it, it, schools have become activism schools. They haven't become an educational platform, uh, an educational space for kids to make up their own opinions. Well, they're not- It's a, it's a problem. You know, what's who's, I forgot, forgot his name. He's, um, anyway, he gets attacked also, but he says it's no longer education, it's indoctrination. And when I look at the indoctrination, it is Marx, uh, fascist, and uh, communist. And I, and that's my biggest concern is because, you know, I have two tours in Vietnam and I didn't fight for conservatism or liberalism, I fought for freedom. The freedom of you know, number one is the First Amendment, assembly, speech, and whatever else they had, and the second is the right to bear arms, and um, those are all disappearing. So you can be conservative or liberal, I don't care. You can be a Marx, I don't really care, but uh, don't censor me. And so, how are you guys? What do you recommend for people? What can the per people do to battle, you know, socialist Silicon Valley? Well, I think we need to come together because it's been death by a thousand cuts. That's number one. We haven't been organized. And so a big part of what PragerU is trying to do is to just bring everybody together. Again, you don't have to agree with us on everything we have to say. You don't have to agree with every video that we have. But if you believe in freedom of speech, if you believe that another side, another perspective should be heard out there, then join us, join our movement. You can join our communities. If you're under the age of 34, you can join Prager Force. If you have kids, or grandkids that are under the age of 34, these young folks are the ones that need the organizing more than anybody because they are truly, truly alone on campus. Uh, and so, or, or if they're just starting a job in corporate America, I imagine how hard it is for them to hold these values. And so we've created this group called Prager Force. We have 15,000 students and working professionals in it, and we want that group to grow. And so encourage people that you know to go to prageru.com and join prager force if you're a parent a grandparent or an educator we created another group that can organize together that one is called prep prager you for uh resources for educators and parents where we not only produce content for kids and educators to show students um but we also organize parents so they can meet other like-minded folks and, and troubleshoot through what's going on. Uh, and so we just need to get organized. We need to come together. There are many of us who agree in classical liberalism, conservatism, all of us who don't want our, our kids to be taught critical race theory. We don't want corporate America to adapt all these, you know, white fragility concepts that they're, they're, they're destroying businesses with. It's, it's absurd. So, Come join us so we're not doing it alone and uh, and speak out. We can't be afraid. I know this is it's a new level of courage that our our country is demanding right now. And so we might not be, you know, grabbing uh, our armor and ri uh, running into battle. But there is a war of ideas and it needs to be fought or we will lose America as we know it. And I agree with you 100 percent. And I'll come back and I'll talk to you about apparently you served in Israeli intelligence and uh, you have some comments about for other women and girls about how do you uh, stay strong in this kind of nuts world. So when we come back, we'll be talking again to Marissa Streit and it's at a Prager University, but more importantly, how do we fight for our freedoms? So Prager, you and Rich Dad are very similar because we're educational companies. 
but we're fighting for our freedoms. When we come back, we'll be continuing on with Marissa's trite. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And like I said, we have uh, our guest today is somebody we're joined, you know, mentally, physically, and spiritually together. It's Prager University because they're fighting for freedoms the freedom of speech, the freedom to think what we want to think, and the, you know, basically our freedoms. So PragerU is, you know, spiritually and uh, mentally united here. Our guest today is Marissa Streich. She's the CEO of Prager University. She is a member of Israeli intelligence, which I have tremendous respect for. I mean, you know, I think Israel was formed in 1947, the year I was born. And in 1967 was the, the first war, well, not the first war, but they kicked Egypt's butt. And I was so inspired. It was 1967, I was 20 years old. And because I saw the Israeli Air Force just cream the Arab, or well, the Egyptian Air Force. And I went to talk to my English teacher and he was a bomber pilot in World War II, a B-17 pilot, he got shot down twice. And I had this high paying job waiting for me. And I said, I kind of like what those Israelis are doing. He says, then go fly. And I, I gave up a very high paying job to make $200 a month as a Marine pilot. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made. So I have tremendous respect for Israel. I've met uh, your leaders there and uh, they don't mince their words. <laughs> They're pretty blunt, which I appreciated. And uh, so I want to find out two things. You know, one was how did you get into Israeli intelligence, but also what do you have, what message do you have for women? Because that's a whole nother subject. So first, what did you do for Israeli intelligence? Okay, so I'm an American that was raised in Israel. When I was seven years old, my family moved to Israel. When I was 16 years old, I got a little brown envelope in the mail. And it was basically, you know, a summon for testing. Uh, and so I still remember this so well. I, I, I walked into this massive room with lots of students and tiny little wooden pencils. And they just started testing us. And the room got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. Um, and eventually they figured out what the hell to do with me, I guess. Uh, after a few interviews on my 18th birthday, they recruited me. Uh, I got a bunch of shots and I, and I joined the military. And so I served in a small unit unit called um, 8200, uh, which was an intelligence. And, you know, Israel is constantly under attack. Uh, it can't afford to make big mistakes and it makes many mistakes, but none of them are ones that Israel can afford to do. And so intelligence is, is key. It's very important. Uh, limited resources in Israel. Um, and, you know, I feel like so much of what I learned in the Israeli military and intelligence has impacted the way I think today. It's such a gift what they had given me. Uh, I'm incredibly mm. grateful, especially as an American. I was raised in Israel, but because I came with an American family, I felt very strongly American there. Um, and uh, coming back here to the United States with the gifts that Israel had given me during my military training, I felt compelled to at least employ them here in, in my country, in my nation, in the United States. So, and wait, so, wait, so what's happening yeah. today? Because there's a lot of conflict in Israel. To, this is the May of 2021, just for reference. What's happening right. today? Well, um, about a week or so ago, uh, violence erupted uh, with the, of course, Hamas uh, encouraging its citizens uh, to uh, fulfill their mission to try to annihilate Israel. They don't want Israel to exist whatsoever. I mean, they chant it all the time, uh, you know, from the, what is it, from the ocean to the sea, Palestine will be free. And so they don't want any Israel whatsoever. Uh, they're not even attempting to hide it. Uh, and so they found a reason to ignite violence and missiles have been um, launched into uh, Israeli Israel, Israeli cities and you know Israel not not only does Israel in my opinion have the right to defend itself Israel has the obligation to defend its right. citizens and so when Israel defends its citizens and thankfully Israel has this incredible technology the Iron Dome where they're able to actually stop the rockets from landing into the Israeli cities cities mid-air, uh, it's such a blessing to have that kind of technology, uh, but some of the rockets do fall in. And then on top of it, many of the 
Palestinians and the terrorists involved in in uh, in this recent eruption are running into Israel into the cities and causing all kinds of additional violent attacks, whether it's stabbing or or um, you know driving with their cars through Israeli uh, uh, neighborhoods and restaurants, and and so it's very hard. I mean, I remember living there during um, multiple intifadas, which is what we call those. Um, violent periods of times where the Palestinians would would go in. It's very hard, but it's not a it's not a conventional war. It's a war against citizens. Um, it, luckily for Israel, it has some ability to defend defend its citizens through technology. But it's it's the, the classic example of the fact that people in social media and around the world who don't understand the conflict look at it as if well Israel is able to defend itself and it's 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 made more progress and it appears stronger and therefore if they appear stronger they must be the ones who are actually the bad guys the bad guys are not always the ones who are more successful and stronger that is never that is oftentimes not the case but it's just the way we've taught our kids well you know I mean, it's classic Marxism, right? And it's just beca just because Israel is strong and able to defend itself doesn't mean that they're the aggressor. And, and uh, yeah, I had you know after the '67 war, I had a really really good friend whose name was Saleh Malahi. He was an Arab, and he and I almost cried, you know, because it's not about the people. You know, we're killing yeah. people, ki people killing people. And it's just tragic. You'll be on one side or the other. So I'm not against the Arab people. You know, but it's just tragic what we're doing. I mean, neither am I. I have many Palestinian friends and many Arab friends who 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 hate the situation. The problem for the for Palestinian citizens is truly their leadership uses its own people as cannon father. They truly use them as human shields. Right. And so while Israelis will do everything they can to protect its citizens, the Palestinians don't do the same thing. They actually use their citizens uh, as part of, they want the casualties because it makes Israel look really bad. It's and that makes it very it. hard. Yeah. And, um, I've been to Israel twice and it's such a beautiful country. It's a historic country. I was in Jerusalem. I'm looking at what happened there. I've been to the dome and it's tragic, you know, because it's just, I don't know why it's happening. So let's go on to this thing about you have advice for um, women. What, yeah. what is your point of view on women? Uh, final thing. What about the term girl boss? Isn't girl that boss. Yeah. You know, there's this hashtag that's very popular with uh, millennials and Gen Zers. Hashtag girl boss. I remember uh, seeing that for the first time when somebody actually interviewed me and said, well, what it's like, what is it like to be a female CEO uh, and, and hashtag girl boss? And I actually got very irritated because I said, you know, I'm just my, my hashtag is simple, bo simply, I guess, boss, because it, it the balance sheet, uh, the the uh, the roll call of the folks that work for us. We have 70 employees. No, it doesn't matter what my genitalia is. All that matters is that I'm able to do the job that I, that that I've uh, been hired to do. And so, you know, I'll say I think the feminist movement has gone uh has gone so far that they've actually not only hurt women, but they've hurt our society and they've hurt young women in particular. And to me, uh, some of the crutches that our society is trying to develop where they're saying, well, there should be a quota of a number of women on a certain board or a quota of number of women on, on uh, in, in, in different positions, I think is very demeaning. I think that women are incredibly capable uh, and we don't need the crutches. And I think that once you start with a narrative that if you're hiring a woman, you should treat her differently by giving her additional crutches and additional support systems that you wouldn't be getting giving to other people. Well, what does that say to women about their capabilities? It says that they are in fact inferior. And I don't believe that women are inferior. I mean, here I am, I, as I mentioned, uh, Dennis and Alan hired me 10 years ago to build this company. Um, and I'm really proud of what I've done. And I'm, I'm able to be proud of it because I know they didn't hire me because I'm a woman. You know, maybe they hired me because of my Israeli military background. Maybe they hired me because of my passion. Maybe they hired me because, you know, I'm just tough as nails, whatever it is. But it's not because of my genitalia. And there's something to be said about knowing that I was hired because of my merit and my capabilities uh, and not because I was handed a crutch. And I want other women to feel 
feel that way too. And so if we tell women and we tell the uh, so basically the, our society that women should be given crutches, that people of any, any sort of gender or color should be given certain crutches that others don't get, we're sending a very strong message that there are some who are more capable than others. And I won't accept that. Good for you. I mean, I wish my wife Kim was here because she'd be cheering you on right now because you don't mess with Kim. <laughs> I'll let you in on a secret, which I think you're quite aware of, but men like, uh, women like real men. We don't like soy boys. Uh, and so, you know, the problem is that our society is confusing everybody. You're confusing, oh. dating right now is a bloody nightmare because the men don't know how to behave. The women don't know how to behave. Uh, you know, there is the nature that we are completely suppressing the nature of, of how, how men and women are supposed to interact. And I think there is something so amazing about the fact that we're different, uh, but we're trying to make them both exactly the same. And like, you know what? I want, I want, I married, I'm married with three kids, but my husband paid for the first on the first and second date. And I love that about him. And he opened the door for me. And I love that about him. And there's certain things that I do as a woman and he loves that about me. And so yeah. there's a, there is an understanding for, there is an understanding that there's some basic differences between the, the sexes. And, and when you're, you know, all this toxic masculinity nonsense, I was like, you know, we need real men. We need real men to be law enforcement officers. We need them to be in, in the military and we need them to just be good husbands that protect their families and, and don't see themselves as, you know, effeminate creatures. And so, uh, you know, the, it's it's another one of those bizarre things that our education system is uh, is causing total chaos in our society. And I know we're both in the world of education because we recognize that education got us into this mess and education is going to have to get us out of this mess. Amen. 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 Marissa, you know, th thank you very, very much. Uh, like I said, Rich Dad and Prager University are different companies, but we're we're joined by the same mission. Are both educational companies and how can people support you i mean can we send money to you and things like that you so guys first of all thank you thanks for asking we're a nonprofit, and so everything we're doing is all made thanks to donations from yeah. people who listen in and love our content and pay it forward so you could go to prageru.com click on the donate button and do do what you can to help us out um, we have donor clubs at different levels, but you know, if you can even give on our Prager United once a month, make a difference, skip a coffee uh, and uh, make that contribution to Prager, that would be really helpful. And I'll just end with one quick plug. My son, who's eight years old, loves your book. And oh. so I gave him your book and we're playing the game and uh, it's, I, it's never too early to start with financial literacy, even at eight. Well, really what, what Rich Dad, Poor Dad is a primer on capitalism, you know, and it's, it's basic income statement and balance sheet and statement of cash flow, which is capitalism. So you guys keep up the great work. Your, 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 your content is so simple yet brilliant. I mean, that's what I love about it is straight, it's just straight shooting. So really thank you, keep up the good work. You'll have my donations coming into you on a regular basis, but uh, thank I you. thank you for being partners in the battle against soy boys and ball busting women. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. Uh, the good news and bad news about money, but this is a very important call. I thank Marissa uh, Strait because this is about education and Dennis Prager's Prager University and Rich Dad. We're on the same side, the same team and all this. And uh, I really appreciate what she said. That's guts. I mean, I have tremendous respect. Marissa being a tough woman, if she was an Israeli defense, she had to be really tough because those guys are tough. So, Sarah, as a woman, <laughs> what did you think about soy boys and uh, weak, strong women? Well, first I have to say, Marissa is what I would describe as a badass woman. Yeah. Someone I don't want to mess with. Um, but I think from a woman's perspective, we don't have a lot of women speaking out about some of these major topics that are in the media. Yeah. Um, you know, we've we've learned from Rollo Tomasi. You know, we hear from men a lot, yeah. but we don't hear from women. So it's kind yeah. of refreshing. And I know Kim would agree if she were yeah. here. Like you said, she would have totally been on Marissa's side and, and cheering her on because that's 
you know, Kim is a self-made oh, woman. Sh- you know, she's not, she, you know, her whole philosophy is you don't need a man. Um, and for Kim, financial security. But yeah. we see, you know, like Marissa said, there's a place for a, a man in the home. There's a place for a man raising his kid, you know, yeah. as, a, as a human or a um, family unit. So it's very cool perspective. Second thing I want to say is we are so aligned with Prager's, you know, what their mission is. And, and really it's fighting for freedom. And that's what we've kind of taken on this last year is, right. is, is what that freedom looks like. Yeah. Um, so you, you can be a soy boy and a ball busting woman, or you can be whatever you want, but don't take our freedoms right. away. Right, exactly. Yep. And, and that's why I have tremendous respect for Dennis Prager and Prager University. But you can always tell the quality of a person and their company by the product they produce. So please go to Prager University, look at their content. It is brilliant, it's simple. I think the little short five minute videos, yeah. every time I've seen them, it opens my mind up to what the mainstream socialist press will never tell us. Right. So that's what's beautiful about Prager University. So any final words for all the women out there, Sarah? I mean, For all the women, let your men be men. <laughs> um, don't be soy boys. Don't be soy boys. That's, my, that's one of my favorite words right now because more men are being raised by single mothers today because men have been raised by single mothers and then they go to school to be taught by women primarily. And there's nothing wrong with that, <clears throat> except that there's a, you know, like some of my best teachers and my worst teachers were men. My worst teacher was a man, but so are my best teachers. Most of the women I, I couldn't get along with because, you know, I was not a very good student. <laughs> but anyway, they did their best with me. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. and I think, you know, <clears throat> we're just what they're fighting for, we're, we're in this war of ideas and so this would, this is typically not our typical radio show. We, you know, we're not talking yeah. about macroeconomics, but we are talking about freedoms and the ability, um, you know, to do and think how you please. And, and I, that's why I love this show, this yeah. episode. We're fighting for education right. and our current education is Marxist. I hate to say that, you know, rich dad, poor dad is a book on capitalism. And that's why the New York times came after me and all this stuff. This is 25 years ago. And today we're all over the world. We're in Target, Walmart, Costco. All the bookstores were, were the top of all the um, bestseller lists because all we're teaching is basic capitalism. So thank you very much. Thank you to Marissa and Prager University. And thank you all for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Program.